Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Imperfect Marketing. I'm your host, Kendra Corman, and today I have with me Chris Weir. He is a video producer with over 20 years of experience in the industry. His company, Cleaver Creative, has created B2B animations, sales presentations, and commercials seen by millions, and now works with business owners to help them create their own videos. And really, what I love the most is that he cares about results. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Kendra. It's super fun. So I love video because I think that, well, I always tell all my clients, people don't read. So video is something that they do actually watch, right? Especially if it's interesting. So why do you have a passion for B2B businesses using video? Sure. So I have been running my business for 10 years. And about three years ago, I started making videos on LinkedIn. And this was at a time when to make a video on LinkedIn, it like blew people's minds. They're like, what? You can do that? It's like, yeah, yeah, it supports video. It has for like the past eight years, but people weren't really leveraging it for a while. Um, and what I found in doing that was the clients that we gained through creating videos on LinkedIn were much more aligned to my values and uh, personality alignments. And so that was a hidden benefit that I just didn't expect. I knew that there was traction there. I knew that this was going to help us grow. Uh, but I didn't really realize that there would be this benefit of like, oh, they're choosing me as much about my expertise as my personality. And therefore, when you even have that first discovery call, you're like, wow, we get along really well because they've already met you. So that has been a, a really interesting benefit to to using video uh, for B2B marketing. I love that because I find, I tell people, I'm like, well, we don't even know if we like each other yet. So like, let's talk. Uh, because <laughs> it's true. If you're going to be working for someone, you need to make sure that you get along with them, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes into that no like and trust factor that is why people buy from you. Mm -hmm. And I think video and the reason I do podcasting is people feel that connection to me after listening to me for weeks on end um, with these different podcast episodes. So I think video and again, just more than just written content really creates that connection. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I tell folks too that for, for some people, video works really well for no like and trust. But for some people, it's good for just know and like. And then you do need other content to build the trust because some of their content is very technical. It's very specific. And, you know, for the common person, for the average person, it might be kind of boring. But if you bring people in with a video where they get to know you, they get to know what you're about, what you believe, what you find interesting in the world, then they're going to be more likely to want to read, you know, a two-page article about process improvement. So it's it's like you don't have to use it for all three, but it, it can work for all three, but it doesn't have to. Okay. That's a really good way of thinking about it. I do yeah. I do like that. <laughs> so let's say somebody listening right now or watching on YouTube it wants to make their first video. How do you recommend they get started? Usually what I tell folks is to write down 10 frequently asked questions that they get from prospects and clients. I've got a cat trying to make an appearance here in the, in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, 10 frequently asked questions. Um, but then 10 questions that they don't get asked that they really wish people would ask. And usually those questions are the ones that their light, their eyes light up and they're like, oh, I really wish somebody would ask me X, Y, Z. For me, the first video I made on LinkedIn was, why should you be making videos on LinkedIn? People often come when they want to make a video and they say, I know I want to make a video. How much does it cost? How does the process work? What is involved? Who's going to do it? All these other things. But people typically don't ask me like, why should I be making videos? And that was the first video that I made on LinkedIn. And immediately people were like, oh, I like, I like what you have to say. Um, so, so those are the places that I would start. Write down those frequently asked questions, write down the ones that you wish you were being asked, and then pick up your phone and answer them. 
And I often tell people like, just because you record a video doesn't mean you have to post it. So like, just record it, see if you like it. And if you do, then post it. If you don't, then maybe try another question or try another take. Um, so th the key really is just getting started. Like that is the hardest part. It is, it is this big hurdle that people are terrified of. They want it to be perfect. That's the other thing is that it's a medium where as business owners, we always want to be seen as being perfect. We don't want to have any flaws. Uh, obviously, you know, cause like you're, you want your clients to see you that way in video having some mistakes in there, having some accidents where a cat walks through the frame, how do you, how you handle it? Do you get really mad and like just end the interview or do you kind of go with the flow and like, how do you handle problems? How do you handle mistakes? Um, also informs people. So that's why I say like the, the getting started process is hard for video because people want it to be perfect. And ideally it should be just slightly imperfect, which we're just not used to as, as business owners. Progress over perfection. I say it all the time. One of my previous podcast guests um, works on building connections on LinkedIn and Facebook, things like that. But one of the things that she said is she was doing a webinar and her dog got sick towards the end of it. And she said in the beginning, she would have totally freaked out. But she was like, okay, my dog just got sick. We're almost to the end of this. Let's just finish up and then we'll deal with it in a second. But again, it endeared people to her because it felt very authentic. The more staged things are, I think the less authentic people think it is. And, you know, that I think actually negatively affects their opinion of you. Right. It just distances them from you because something feels off they can't put their finger on it but they're like this is too overproduced it's too staged it's too scripted and it doesn't feel real it doesn't feel authentic yeah yeah no i think that that's really important so let's talk a little bit one of the questions that you said people jump into is what does it cost so what does it cost to make a video sure so we have a couple different vlogging packages um the first vlogging package is package is 575 per month for two videos and the way that works is very similar to this kind of recording we use riverside as well mm -hmm. um and basically i get on and we 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 coach them through their topic and how to deliver that to their network uh and then there's a a, a larger package which is four videos a month at 775 so i think for the average business owner that um you know is maybe solopreneur maybe a little bit above that where they have a couple employees it's a good affordable thing and then usually what i say is work with us for three months let's make you know the videos that we make for that time and then let's evaluate how it works and decide how well is it fitting into your marketing plan and what are the results that you're getting and then some people take that and they just run with it and they go like okay I'm, i got it i figured it out i'm going to keep making my own videos as i want to on my schedule and some people just like the process and they like the accountability to saying okay i have a monthly recording schedule we're going to meet we're going to talk through my ideas we're going to record it and then that's done for the month which 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 is nice for them Accountability has a lot of value. I mean, there is a lot there to holding ourselves accountable. Yes, yes. Because honestly, I mean, I've been doing a vlog a week or a video a week for three years now. It's never something that I'm like, can't wait to get out of bed to do. But once I've done it, once I've recorded it, and especially once it's posted, I'm like, oh, that is, I love this. You know, I love the results that I'm getting. I love seeing people's reactions. I love getting people inbound messages about it. So it is one of those things that's very time intensive or energy intensive, I should say. Actually, the time for recording a vlog, I think, is less than a podcast or writing an article. Um, but it's energy intensive, especially for somebody, I don't know if you're introverted or extroverted, but I'm definitely introverted and it takes energy to, to make. It, yeah. So I am what I refer to as an outgoing introvert because I moved a lot growing up. And so I had to learn to be outgoing, but yeah, at the end of the day, like wrap a bubble around me because I need my alone time. <laughs> right. I heard a really great term a while ago called ambivert, 
Ooh. which I think is an overlooked term. And we're probably, most of us are more ambiverts. We lean one way or the other. But uh, yeah, I like that. I like ambivert. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit. Now, the questions that I get asked are, I'm like, I'll say to somebody, okay, well, you need to get out there with video. Start recording. Just start posting things. You know, what's the worst that can happen? And, well, I don't like how my hair looks in that. And I don't like how my voice sounds. The bags under my eyes are annoying. Um, although my favorite is, I think, the bags under my eyes are like Louis Vuitton or something. But that was one of my favorites. <laughs> um, <laughs> Pretty good. So, but I guess, um, what... What do you say to people that are fighting video because they're uncomfortable with everything? My argument is try it. Try it. You don't like you don't have to post it. And and it really now that we have these amazing phones, we with these amazing cameras, um you can film something in half an hour and look at it and go, does it have merit? Do we want to keep doing this? try it and i i would encourage people to get to the point where you post it like maybe the first one you record you don't like it and the next week you try it again and it gets a little bit better by the third week you try it one more time You're like okay i could feel comfortable posting it you really don't know what the reaction is going to be until you actually put it out there in front of people and then you can really judge like did people like the way that I talked about what I talked about? And was there legit connection for people? But I really would encourage people to like, at the very least, try and record one. If you like it enough, post it and see what the reaction is. Some people, video is not a good fit. It just isn't. Like it shouldn't be their primary form of marketing. But I would argue that everyone should hone it as a skill because to me, it is the public speaking skill of 20 years ago. If you wanted to get ahead in corporate America, I was like, you got to get good at public speaking. Now you kind of got to get good at video because it's a scalable way of presenting yourself. And any way you, you go, you're going to have to be in front of people. You're going to have, have to become having conversations. And if you can learn to do that through video, uh, it is a really scalable skill of, of uh bringing yourself to a lot more people. So these videos that you're doing weekly, how long are they? Most of them are two to three minutes max. Uh, I have done some that go over that where they're more of a tutorial style on LinkedIn. Um, you know, we also do YouTube videos as well, which, you know, YouTube ranges in the 10 to 15 to 20 minute mark is usually what they like. But for LinkedIn, it's two to three minutes, and those can be recorded in two to three minutes if you know what you're talking about, if you know the content, which we all do. We all know our areas of expertise inside and out. So if you just write down some notes, you can record one in a couple of minutes, which is a really good, I think, time investment. How bad is it if someone's looking at notes? Do you say, like, if they go, like, I'm looking at my questions over there every once in a while, and... I don't think it's bad at all. So we have one client who is a senior mortgage lender. And he, a couple times a week, he's very on top of the news. He has an incredible mind, um, reads tons and tons of articles about what's going on with the mortgage markets and all these things. He's able to re memorize a lot of statistics and facts easily but occasionally he's just looking at the article and he's like this is the article i'm looking at right now i'm talking about this da, 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 da. It, it feels organic and the same is true if just looking at your own notes like i have clients too that like they have their notes i say don't read off a script but it's fine to look at your notes the days of the you know perfect corporate video where you know <laughs> you're staged and have your tie and like lighting and stuff like that uh that's gone away and so whatever helps you get through your content as long as it feels authentic to you i say go for it if you need notes if you want notes if you want the notes specifically for remembering just certain facts and figures it's fine to look at that um, I have experimented with different things where, you know, there's teleprompter apps as well, where I've actually scripted things out because I wanted to get content across more efficiently. 
And I actually felt like those were, even though I think I'm pretty good at reading a teleprompter, I thought that those were less authentic than formulating the thoughts sentence by sentence, even if I have to stop rolling and, and cut together a couple different takes. Um, it felt better. It felt more like a real connection with people. So notes are fine. Use them if you want to. End of monologue. <laughs> yeah, I've had a couple of clients do um, brand videos and we scripted them out and they'd read the teleprompter like two or three rounds through just so we had like the baseline, some of the buzzwords that they wanted to say and stuff like that. Then I would sit in front of the camera and I would ask them questions like that would reflect a little bit about what was in the script, but it gave them a chance to answer me and talk to me. And people really liked that. Um, it comes out more, a lot more natural and they seem to like their responses better. Yes. And I think it's an interesting thing because I've interviewed a lot of people as well. And it's an interesting thing where, where, Sometimes people need the opportunity to say something the wrong way first. So then you can go back and say, okay, I love that story, but can you tell it to me in one or two sentences? And oftentimes they can. And oftentimes it's the last thing they say <laughs> is they go. So what I really want to say is they just, they just summarize everything they just said. So that's another odd part about, I think, recording yourself is giving yourself permission to do it wrong and then go back and go, could I do it shorter? Could I do it more efficiently or what have you? So, yeah, absolutely. Like people, that's another way that I think people can think about it, too, is is, is it can feel very alien recording yourself just into a camera. You don't get any response. You don't know what people are thinking. You can ask somebody on your team or a friend or what have you and say, listen, ask me these five questions and then ask follow-up questions. Let's have a conversation about it. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense when people are first getting started. Just be careful on who you pick to ask questions <laughs> or evaluate because sometimes my husband will be sitting at his desk in my office and this is why I stopped recording when he's here. You said, um, a lot. Mm -hmm. I did <laughs> roll with it. <laughs> I'm a big um and ah uh person as well. Once I started hearing so many interviews with Barack Obama and how he would go, uh, well, we're going to uh, do this uh, this way. Uh, I was like, okay, it's fine. Uh, and um, I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so is my favorite filler word. I'll say so. Moving on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's my transition word for everything. <laughs> Okay. So I was going to say, okay. So, so, so when somebody is getting started, um, what kind of equipment do you encourage your clients to purchase or invest in, or do you just have them start? Sure. The only tools I tell them to buy is usually a lavalier microphone. Uh, Rode R-O-D-E makes a really great uh, wired lavalier microphone that plugs into your Android phone or your iPhone with an adapter. Um, and then a small tripod selfie stick that can sit on your desk. Um, those are really all you need. The, the phones that we have now, the cameras that are in the phones are so good. I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years and would have, uh, you know, killed someone for one of these phones when I was 20. Like the camera is amazing. So you don't need a fancy camera anymore. Um, you have it in your phone. And if you just have a stable lockdown shot with decent audio, that's all that people care about. All they really care about is seeing your face and they don't want this big overproduced thing. Um, also doing it yourself and, and recording that way it gives you room to improve and, and bring more production value as you go. So usually when we're working with a new client, um, the first videos that we do will have very limited graphics and branding and those types of things because we, we want their network to feel like it's really coming from them, which it is. And then as we go along, we'll start to add more things to keep it interesting for their audience. People want to be surprised. They want to see new things over time. But as you get started, like 
you just need your phone and and maybe a tripod and a mic and you're good to go. It's a lot simpler than people think to get started with video. And I think that that's what's key. Again, it's yes. quality audio, um, a quiet, small place to record, preferably something that's like got carpeting. Oh, um, not, <laughs> right. not the bathroom. I know it's small, but it echoes, right? So um, those I think are really important. Absolutely. And there's certain... Um like little tips that I would recommend for people if they're going to give it a shot, which is to, you know, most people are going to use their selfie camera and it's very um, tempting to look at yourself because it's your face right in front of your face. So you're going to look at yourself like you're looking in the mirror. That looks weird though. You want to look in the camera lens, which is, you know, to the edge of the camera. Most people don't even think about that because they've got so many other things to think about, but you really want to do that. And so usually what we tell folks is if they're having a hard time with that, get a, a sticky note and just put it like, once you have yourself framed, put it over your face in the screen so that you can't see yourself, you know, hit record, put that over there and then go. And then that, then it allows you to focus right on the camera lens. Like you're talking to right into somebody's, you know, eyeballs. No, oh, I think that's a great tip and a great addition because, yeah, you definitely want, and it's the edge of the camera lens, not straight in, because then it looks like you're looking up is what I've right. been finding. Right. Yes. Because I'm always looking for the perfect place. I actually switched my monitor so that my camera was lower for my recordings now because it yes. was too high. And I was like, like God, I look tired. Eye level is usually uh, a good guideline. Yeah. So... Let's talk a little bit about how much content somebody needs to be putting out to really drive results because results are what matter, right? It doesn't, we're not making videos to make videos, right? We're making videos to get business or to get inquiries, whatever KPIs, key performance indicators we're using to indicate success. Um, how, like you've got two different packages that, that range between two and four videos a month. How much should somebody really be doing? Sure. So I think it's really interesting because because there's certain folks out there, you know, Gary Vee is is famous for you know, everybody should be putting out 10 posts a day about all this stuff. And it's like you got to have a lot of good stuff to say to be able to put out 10 posts a day and think that people have the time to care about it. Um. My recipe for most B2B business people is one video a week. Start with one video a week and do that for three months and see where you're at in three months. See what new connections you've made. See what connections you've made to like old people in your network that may have seen these, these things and reached out. Once you've done that, then maybe you want to change it up and maybe you want to go once every two weeks. It really depends on the results you're getting and the interactions you're having. And it also depends on the other content that you're putting out there. Because like we were talking about, like your video might feel, you know, uh, satisfy that no like and trust. You might be able to show exactly what you do in your work through video really easily. But you also might not be able to. And you might also need to be having other pieces of content, whether it's a newsletter and articles and what have you, to fill in that trust piece to really show here is a case study we did with a business, you know, two months ago and gives in tons of details that you're just not going to go into in a video. So side note, case studies are really good. People love reading them. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And sometimes you can do a video case study, but a lot sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. So um, yeah, I would say start with one video a week. And if you have other content that should dovetail nicely with that, I don't think you really, most business people need to be doing more than that, um, for their businesses and then decide, you know, after a while, do I want to, do I want to go down or do I want to stay at one video a week? But that consistency is really important. And I think his consistency is the key word there. It's really important because... I think it does on its own being consistent drive that trust factor a little bit because so many people are not consistent. They just don't have the time to be consistent. And if they're not going to be consistent, how can I trust them to take care of what I need done? Absolutely. I, I really try and tell folks that it's similar to networking. It's no different than networking. 
when you go to a networking event, you don't expect on the first one you go to to be like, 10 people are going to sign up as new clients with me on the very first networking event. Um, you need to go there every week for several months to build that trust and to show up every single week. Um, and really doing video for LinkedIn is networking at scale. When you go to a networking event, you might meet six people. When you put out a video on LinkedIn, you're essentially meeting 600 people. So it's this exact same principle, really. Not very good. And I, I like setting expectations because I think that that's really important. And I also like the fact that you talked earlier on about starting to work with you for three months. You've got to do something for three months. I plan everything in three month increments. You're not going to find if something works or doesn't work in a week. Mm -hmm. And you need mm -hmm. to be, again, consistent with it and see how it works and see how it goes from there. Some things are going to take more than three months, right. but right. it's always good to, to try it. And at least three months is a really good rule of thumb, I think. Absolutely. And like, yeah, like you, you very well may not make a sale. I mean, I would say most people are not going to make a sale in the first three months. We have had some folks that like put out a video in the first week and they've got a new client from it. Like, that's awesome. But they were already doing other, other marketing efforts before that. So then when they put out the video, people are like, oh, wow, you're really committed to this. I've been meaning to reach out to you already. Um, some clients it's taken over a year. And I would usually say, think about what your normal sales cycle is. And so if, if it takes you, you know, a year from meeting someone to usually close them, then you're probably not going to make a sale faster than that through your video marketing. But you might want to look at that typical sales cycle as a goal to say, like, will I make a sale in a year? And if, if I'm getting close, then maybe this is working. Oh, very good. Very good. Well, I think this was really helpful. Hopefully we have converted some people that have been putting off trying to start some video recording of themselves and posting it on LinkedIn or whatever social media platform they choose to use. But before I let you go, Chris, I do want to ask uh, the question that I ask everybody. This show is called Imperfect Marketing because marketing is anything but a perfect science, as you and I both well know. What has been your biggest marketing lesson learned? I would say it is that lesson of consistency plus quality. I think that, you know, as I was saying earlier, we... We get really hung up on being perfect. We get really hung up on my message has to be perfect. I have to do this and um, get it exactly right. And, and consequently, then the consistency can suffer. And so what I, what I tell folks is that consistency plus quality equals growth. And the higher you are on quality and the higher you are on consistency, the higher you're going to be in your growth. But we often don't think about consistency as that same value as, as having high quality content. So whatever you decide to do it, maybe you decide you don't want to do a video a week, maybe, but maybe you want to decide you want to do a video a month. That's fine. There's certain very well-known YouTubers that put out a couple really great videos a year, and that is it. That's all they do. That is, they didn't always do that. They did smaller videos at a uh, quicker turnaround time. But now they do a couple of really high quality, high production videos a year, and that's their recipe. But they are consistently doing that and they come out at the same time every year. Their audience knows what to expect. So that would be my biggest lesson probably is that consistency piece. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Chris. Thank you all for tuning in. If you learned something today, be awesome if you would rate and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. If you want to connect with Chris, be sure to take a look in the show notes. We'll have a link to his LinkedIn profile where he shares regular updates, as you've heard, about how to do better with video. And thank you again all for tuning in to another episode of Imperfect Marketing. Have a great rest of your day.